My name is Dr. Henry Lustiger Thaler. Uh, this is an interview that is co-sponsored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Amoresh Memorial Museum in Brooklyn. Uh, we will be interviewing Mrs. Esther Petersile today. Mrs. Petersile, can you tell me your date of birth yes. and the town and country you were born in? Well, my name is Esther Petersile. I was born in Benjin. <laughs> that, that, the 12th December 23, 1924. Tell me a little bit about Benjin, Benjin your, your earliest well, memories. Well, I, you know, Benjin was in Schlesia, this you know, and the coal mines were in our area. So most of the Gentiles, being that they were not educated, they worked in the coal mines. And the woman had to work too, so they, were, they did domestic work. But the Jewish uh, community was very close together. You know, we had a lot of organizations, uh, uh, Zionist organizations. I belong to Hanor Hatsioni. So did your cousin, Lola. Mm -hmm. We were in the same quarter. Henyek was in an older group. And we had a very nice life. We were very, it, it was like the elite group of Zionism. And, you know, we were, the, most of the people were Zionistic or religious. My father was a Radomsky Huset. And my father was a very well-known man. His grandfather was the, he built the first brewery in Poland. And uh, he grew up together with the Radomsky Rebbe. The Radomsky Rebbe, I don't know if you know about him. Mm -hmm. His name was Rabinovich. I have a picture of him that is made from Shir Hashirim, mm -hmm. from the Song of Songs. And, uh, and he was a very wealthy man. He, was, he owned a lot of real estate in Germany. And he had that tremendous factory, a larger textile factory. And he lived in Sosnovitz, and they were very close. My brother was working, he was the head salesman in his company. When it came Friday, he came back from his uh, shifts, from, from the week, the week work. So he stopped off to report to the rabbi. So he said, Ben Zion, do me a favor, don't go home to Benjin, don't break your father's heart, it's almost Sabbath. But he wouldn't do it, he would come home. And, uh, you know, most of the people were involved either in a Zionist organization or very religious people. We had Gerich see them, Radomsker see them, and, and many others, but there was always discussions. When it came to a discussion between the people from these various uh, stables, there was always a fight. Everyone sticked up for their own. We lived right next to our our place. The Radomsky Street was right next house to ours. But it, we had a beautiful shul, but my father wouldn't go to the shul. My mother was a prominent member. She was sitting in front, in front of her, you know, on the balcony. And our pleasure was when the holiday came, that we were sitting, we could go to the synagogue and join the parents. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a real Jewish life, and we had a comfort there. We were not uh, rich, rich people. We were comfortable people. We always lived with help in the house, and, and as much we could be educated, we were educated. Unfortunately, when it came to me, my education was in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less, we had friends, and we stick usually to friends that they were the same age, that they belonged. They had the same background. You know, I was always concerned that my parents wouldn't stop me seeing this one or that one. I always followed. I was always a good child and listened to the parents. And I felt that they know more than I do. So I was a good kid. So you're mentioning education, but you went to a Baisiaco? In or uh, the Basiaco was on our street. I didn't like the Basiaco. Uh -huh. My father took in a rabbi. I didn't learn too much in Yiddish. But you know what? I was still a kid. I was 11 years old when we came back from the country. Mm -hmm. 
when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. I know how to read, but I don't know the meaning of it. So when I went the first time to Israel, my sister-in-law said to me, you don't know what you miss, that you don't know Hebrew. If you would read it and understand it, it gives you a complete different feeling. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I never made it. I tried many times to go to Israel. I went once with the kinder transport, and this was still before my getting married. They, with the kinder transport, and I came back. Then I was caught in, on my way because we were smuggling through Italy to get to Israel. Mm-hmm. So it was rainy, though. We had to go through a mountain. And I couldn't walk anymore, so I figured, the heck with it, I'm going to go back. I saw a light from a distance. So when I saw it, so I, I, I fell down from the mountain, and I fell down to the police station. So they kept me there for a few days. <laughs> so I said, you know what, I am from, I lived in Milan, and I wanted to go back to Salzburg because I had a sister there. And she died. So no matter whatever I said, he didn't believe me. But he let me go. So I went back to Salzburg. Let's just go back back to Benjin before we enter into uh, the... Um, Pardon me? We'll go back to uh, Benjin. After and, the war? No, no, just to, to your, early, your early life in Benjin before, before the war. Um, and if you could just tell me a little bit more about the atmosphere of Benjin, for example, what was a... A Shabbos evening, like your Saturday family. was like a Sabbath. It was quiet, you know. Nobody drove. We didn't have cars yet. We didn't have telephones yet in Poland, and we were involved in our, uh, you know, social life. So we used to gather together, you know, with friends. We used to discuss books and organization. We had, uh, you know, we had programs, but I didn't know Hebrew, so I had a problem. <laughs> But it was a nice, it was, we were more or less the same age and everyone was educated. Mm-hmm. Some were already college educated people. And we were the one of the, I belonged to Mishmar Hayarde. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Lola belonged to Mishmar Hayarde and to your cousin. So there were uh, summer camps that you went to? Because Benjin is surrounded by mountains. No, we went only privately uh-huh. on vacation. Uh My father wouldn't let me go to a co-ed camp. So where did you go? I couldn't couldn't go to a co-ed school either. So when I finished uh, public school, uh, I passed to go to a commercial high school because Uh the commercial high school was for girls. But I never made it because Uh Hitler came. So where did you go on vacation with your family? We went to to Rapka, to Raicha, either to the mountains or to a dry climate. Even Olkus was very popular. I don't know if if you ever heard of Olkus. Mm. But when I went back to Poland now, to Auschwitz, Poland was, uh, uh, Olkus was number one place. They were all talking about it. And we went there because it was dry. It wasn't near, we didn't have, uh, you know, lakes or, or seas, we had a dirty river. We lived on the black Semsha, which was filthy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So nobody knew how to swim. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we went on vacation there to Olkus, to Raicha, to Yelesnia. Mm-hmm. But we used to go away every summer. What were the relations between Jews and Christians in Benjin? Did you, did you have there any was... contact at all? or? You know, there was a big resentment. Mm. First of all, don't forget the Poles were not educated. If he worked in a coal mine, he hardly came home. And if she didn't have an income, she had to make a, a few slotties. So they worked as domestic. They didn't know how to write or how to read. Mm. And it's a matter of fact that I came back to Poland the first time. And I went to our apartment, a woman in the ki- from the kitchen, she made three rooms. So I told her, she said she knew my parents. I never saw her, maybe I didn't know her. So she said, why don't you come back? When you were here, we had what to eat, now we are starving. 
And that's the way they were brought. They were, there wasn't one in my days that they were educated. The only time they became educated is when Russia took over Poland. Because he didn't give them food, but he gave them education. Mm. And I don't know if they resented it because they, they lived, first of all, they didn't live in, the, in, in town. They lived in, you know, like in the outskirts. Either they lived near the, the coal mines or in some place in the field, you know. So your house was just near the castle? It's not far from the castle. Not far from the castle. And it's a matter of fact, when I come back, came back the first time, so I said, listen, we lived on Rybne Rynek. We had a very big apartment. We were a big family. We had the whole floor. So I said, I remember going to the Zamek, to the fortress. Where is the fortress? So he showed me his finger that this is it. I asked him for certain streets. I didn't recognize it. It was completely, obviously it was destroyed, but it wasn't the same, and it's still not. They never rebuilt Benjin. And as a matter of fact, the store that we had, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, on a, in a square, not from our, not far from our, our apartment. So when I was there, I couldn't even recognize. It. Nothing was left. They didn't do it, the Poles didn't, did. Of course. So tell me some of your very earliest memories of the impending disaster, the, the, um, the, 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 beginning, the beginning of the, of the war. Do you, do you have a memory of that? What was, what was your experience well, I remember as a, as a young whatever, the, what, what should I, what did I have to remember when the war broke out? It was, the first week was quiet because obviously they started to settle down the Germans, so they didn't do anything. But the war started September 1st, and they were the first day in our town. Our town was the first to go because we were on the border of Schlesien, where all the Schlesien people lived. And they were deserters, they were traitors. They sold Poland to the Germans. So the first week was okay, but the following Friday, the 8th of January, of the September, they, we didn't know, we were already under, under Blocksburg, we had to stay home, to get to the house at seven o'clock in the evening, and if we got up in the morning to go for bread or something, at seven o'clock, so we were not outside. But what they did, the street where the synagogue was, it was the most beautiful synagogue. And this was a place that King Casimir went to Spain. This was in the 15th century. And he felt that after the Inquisition in Spain, he has a possibility to take the Jews to Poland to build up Poland, and that's what he did. And he protected the Jews. So he built for us that synagogue, and the synagogue was right next to his castle. So the next week, the following week, which was the 8th of September, they took, they came, they, they raided the street, and they announced that all the men has to come out and go to the synagogue. Our people were religious, so when they held the synagogue, they all went. And if it wasn't enough, so they searched every apartment, and wherever they saw a man, they dragged them out to go to the synagogue. After they filled up the synagogue, they closed, they locked the doors and put it to explosive and destroyed the synagogue with the people. And this was the end of our synagogue. So this was the first memory. And then later on, we saw all the people being shot in the street, uh, afraid of looking at them, because we were afraid if we looked, they would shoot us. And, and you know, we were young, we didn't even understand. 
I thought that people don't die natural death. They have to be shot to, to die. I didn't know it. So this was, this was the beginning of the war. And to continue it, it's tragic. So, continue. So you want me, could I read a little bit? Of course. Yes. And you know what, being that it's, it's really, very, but it's, it, it tells you everything. So don't be discouraged if it will take a little time. I will read fast. I was born and in Poland, the southern part of Poland. The Jewish population grew there because in the 15th century, King Jan Kazimierz, a friend to the Jews, encouraged them to settle there after fleeing the Spanish Inquisition. He felt they would strengthen the community and its, and its economy. My family settled there in the, 50, in the 17th. I was raised in an Orthodox family of nine children. But one of my brothers was killed during a robbery in my father's business a year before I was born. I was born 24, he was killed 23. Growing up in Benjamin, there was a population of 50,000 people. There were approximately 20,000 Jews. When I came back in the early 1990, there were only three Jewish survivors. Even knowing what happened, it was very hard for me to experience Benjin without a Jewish population. I realized that whatever memories of my childhood I kept with me was completely erased. Even my, my grandfather's grave had now become a main boulevard. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and my town was one of the first to be taken by the Nazis. We had just come home from our summer vacation, and we were ready to go back to school. I was probably 12 years old. As we entered our town, we heard strong noises of tanks and soldiers, but somehow, we managed to reach our home without any problems. Poland and the church, sadly, had a history of anti-Semitism for centuries. Therefore, the Nazis came into our town without any resistance. That happened tragically in many towns in Poland. I'm giving you the history how Poles behaved. As I just said, I remember that the Nazis invaded on September 1st. It was a Friday. The first week seemed to come, and we heard that we were to stay home. Rumors spread that we would have to live by the orders from the Nazis. The following week was the first realization of how cruel the Nazis or SS were, and how the Poles in our community let these tragedies go on. On the following Friday, September 8, the Nazis encouraged all the Jewish men to go to the main synagogue for Sabbath service. Our community was religious, and so with the permission from the Nazis to go to the synagogue, many went. To make sure they were getting all the men, the Nazis searched the street and homes to find as many Jewish men as possible. Unfortunately, no one came back who went. Once the men arrived, they locked the doors and threw explosive that burned down the synagogue with all the worshippers. Several hundred people burned to the ground that night. Our synagogue, which we all took such pride in and held such an important place in our lives, was gone forever. Over the, over the next several weeks, we saw Nazis and SS officers in the thousands moving around all through our streets. 
The first sign of losing our right as human being were posters that ordered all Jews to give up the keys to every Jewish shop and to leave all the merchandise and money behind. In one week, my parents who owned a textile shop lost everything. We were left with nothing. We also had to pay taxes to the Nazis and to give up all our personal precious belongings. To a 12-year-old like myself and to my parents and siblings, life became very scary. There were no stores for Jews to find food. No stores for Jews to find food. Everything was rationed. We had to go out in the middle of the night to, you could, I could read? Yeah, please, yeah. please. To stand in line for a small loaf of bread per family. Forget about anything else. The only way to get additional food was to bribe the Poles with lots of money for any little food we could afford to buy. I remember another terrible story that stays with me during these early weeks. Two young Jewish men were hung by the Nazis for trying to find additional food for their families. These men were taken to the Jewish cemetery, which was next to one of the men's home, so his family could watch and see the execution. My brother was part of the group, but by sheer luck was able to escape. Like my father and most of my family, it only gave, uh, gave him several more months to live. After three months, we were put under curfew. We had to be indoors by seven in the evening until seven in the morning. For the Nazis, this curfew made it easier for them to watch each home take us from our houses, kill us in the street, or transport us to the sports stadium where they separated those to be sent to the concentration camps and those to be left for slave labor. It was during this time that one of my brothers and sisters were pulled from the street and sent away. We never found out what happened to them and we never saw them again. The only thing I can remember was how I used to pray to God to keep my parents with us, to remain all together. I believed I could not survive without them. The Germans took away my education, my youth, my freedom, and the right as a human being. But I could not imagine losing my parents. However, my prayers would not be heard one day, they took my parents with others to an orphanage building where the SS kept people before sending them to Auschwitz. I had no idea where my parents were. But my father managed to escape by jumping out of a second floor window. He came home with broken ribs, but my mother was still there. I was so close to my mother and upset that my father came back alone. I did not realize they were separated when taken. The next morning, <clears throat> I went close to the building where my mother was being kept. I approached an assessment named Dörfle, whose reputation as a murderer was known throughout Belgium. I begged him to release my mother and told him I would get, bring him gold coins for payment. I gave him her name. He went inside, called out her name, and several women attempted to use it for their freedom. I told them none were my mother and went home to bring him a picture. It worked and he actually freed her. Two days later, he came to my home to collect the coins and I knew we didn't have them. With Christmas approaching, I was able to procure him and with ham and cognac and other delicacies to bring to him instead of the coins. I had to remove my yellow star and enter into a building of just Nazis and SS soldiers. I risked my life. 
but survived and brought my mother home. Afterwards, my mother said to me that I had more courage to survive and work. Those, were, those words kept me alive. We were increasingly oppressed with persecution and constant fear. At this point, my family went into hiding. We were a big family and had therefore a, had space in our apartment. My parents took one of our rooms, which joined another building, and built a tunnel from vents that led to a small hiding place. We slept there every night without any light or windows or air. We lived like this for one year until we were found and taken from our home and pushed into the ghetto. This was in the summer of 1942. In the ghetto, they put three to four families in one single room. I don't think I might. I have to explain how living each day, fighting for a piece of bread, struggling with the with diseases and waiting for the next deportation. Each day I left the ghetto for my day and night shift, working in a sweatshop where I had to repair the uniforms of the Nazi soldiers who were fighting on the Russian front. The man who ran the sweatshop was a German man named Rosne, who had already been injured in the war and was given this job. He was kind to me and tried as long as he could to keep my family from being deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. I heard rumors after the war the Nazis executed him for his kindness to many Jews. During the year in the ghetto, my younger sister, Bala, developed rheumatic fever from a strep throat, which led to serious damage to her heart. It was impossible to receive medical care or even simple medication. The fact that we were all useful, helped to keep our family together for a longer time. There were times we continued to escape death. One day, the Nazis called for all disabled Jews to gather for deportation. My younger sister, Il, 10 years of age, was, was required to appear. As the commandant saw her, with her beautiful red hair and exquisite face, he said, she was too young and too beautiful to be deported. At the same time, Birkenau and the concentration camp built specifically for the final solution was not complete. Therefore, they were not deporting everyone for another couple of months. In 1942 came Judenreich, which meant the liquidation of all the Jews. The Gestapo carried out mass roundups on the streets with more speed than ever before. They conducted home arrests in the ghetto and began evacuating all the Jews to one location. The SS had many ways of, demo of demoralizing the Jews by using other Jews. They picked young, strong men to become Jewish policemen and they were in charge of forcing us out of our homes. They conducted home arrests in the ghetto and began evacuating all the Jews to one location, a former orphanage. From here we were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, but were told that Birkenau was a labor camp. Most had never heard of Birkenau, only Auschwitz so they were able to convince us to obey the orders. Is it too much? No. So the first week of August, 1943, I was taken with my parents, my younger sister Bala, one of my older brothers, and we were all put on the cattle cars together to Birkenau. The ride was a couple of hours because our town was only 30 kilometers from Auschwitz. I remember we were locked in the cattle cars without water, windows, or air. Each car had about 200 people, and many died on the route. 
You were the second of two transports that day to Birkenau. The morning transport went straight to the gas chamber. Our transport came in the afternoon. Because there was no room left to gas us, they made a selection instead. Men and women were separated, young from old. At that moment, I ran to be with my mother. She pushed me back and her last words to me were, take care of your sister so she will survive. Oh, God will save you and you will tell what happened to all of us. This was the last time I saw my mother. She was only 49 years old. When I came to camp, we were young, beautiful girls who in a few minutes became ugly without her. We were given rugs to cover our bodies and our heads were completely shaven. We no longer existed with a name, only a number painfully tattooed on our left arm. My number is 52058. However, more than half were already dead. So the number did not reflect how many people were still alive. They pushed us into a large room where they kept us for at least several days. This was the quarantine. As I said, it was August. We were hot, burning up from the heat and sun without a drop of water. We were so desperate for food and water that we would have even eaten crabgrass from the ground but there was only burning dirt. We were kept there until we were assigned out and marched to our barracks, where we would live never knowing for how long. My barrack was number 27, the last on the row and closest to the electric wires. On each wooden bunk, we were 12 girls sleeping next to each other and one blanket to cover all 12 of us. It was agony. We were each handed a red bowl and spoon. This was for the soup, which often was impossible to eat because it was made with dirt and twigs. Once a day in the morning, we were given a small amount of liquid that was called tea. It was the only liquid we were given for the day the bowl also had to serve as a toilet because of the fear that if we went out of the barracks at night, we would have been killed. They also included for the women and men certain medication to stop menstruation and other normal functions in our daily rations. Four a.m. was wake up for counting and selection. The counting took place in front of the barracks. It didn't matter what the weather was, heat, frost, or rain. We stood there hardly covered in clothes, often without shoes or wearing wooden clogs that tore our skin. We waited until Dr. Joseph Mengele would arrive, the highly educated German doctor with his loyal assistant Taube who took all the notes from the selection. They would select by our tattoo number for those to be gassed or for secret medical experiments. These painful experiments were done on young, beautiful women and men until, until he destroyed them medically or just killed them off. We were all young, without any sickness. There was no reason to send us to be gassed but this was his game. He conducted these selections three times a week. They needed to space it in order to not have a long line at the crematorium. However, once a month, Mengele made a big selection. This took place in the bathhouse known as the sauna, where they would delouse our clothes. We were all naked, and Mengele would have a Gestapo woman with a club escorting him to point out which girl were to go to the gas chamber. Every selection took away hundreds of young girls. One day somebody told me that she saw one of my older brothers who had been deported with us. 
He sent a message to me through his friends who was digging ditches for mass graves. He had access to the woman because they were working together and digging the ditches. That's how I got the message. His message said that he would wait on the men's side of the camp by the electric wires at a certain time. Since none of us was aware of actual time, we met after our work day. I went to the electric wire spa, saw him there, and threw over my most valuable possession, my only slice of bread. The next news I heard was that he was sent to the gas chamber, and I never saw my brother again. As for my sick sister with her rheumatic heart, this was a terrible hardship for me to continually protect her and save her from the selections. I would stay up most nights listening to her heartbeat to make sure that she was still alive. I became her mother, and any kind of work we were assigned, I did double production for her and myself. Whenever there was a selection, I kept her in front of me so I could follow her. Whatever would happen to her, would happen to me as well. In December of 1944, Dr. Mengele made the biggest selection that ever took place at the camp. We had to go to the bathhouse and strip off our clothes. It was a very cold winter day and snow was underground. In that selection, I saw him take my sister's number. I followed her, but he skipped me. After Mengele was finished with his selection, I ran out of the bathhouse completely naked, running, running towards the main office. I went over to one of the women who had the list and begged her for mercy to save my sister. Instead, she beat me terribly and threw me out on top of that. The head of my barracks saw me being beaten and added her hits on me as well, but I didn't give up. I stayed outside in the frost, covered with snow, mostly naked. All of a sudden, Hessler, the commandant of Auschwitz, walked by. He stopped and asked me what I was doing lying out here in the snow naked. I told him by mistake I went on the side of the sick people, but he could see now how strong I was standing here in the snow for hours. I then said I also have a younger sister who is even better health than me. He looked at me and said, if you have so much willpower and guts to live, you should. He took me back to the same office where I had been beaten and asked for the list of my barrack. When I pointed to my sister's number, turned on the list, he gave me an eraser to remove her number. Thought he saved my sister's life. That day, the Commandant Hessler continued to murder thousands of innocent people throughout the war. When I went back to the barrack, I quietly hugged my sister and told her that she was not going to the gas chamber. Her answer to me was that she was dreaming of angels. More than half of my barrack and many in the camp were sent to the crematoriums in that selection. As for me, I lost several toes that day due to frostbite sitting in the freezing cold. The next day when they led the list of victims to the gas chamber, Two girls were missing. My barrack guard immediately assumed it was my sister and I. However, the guard she reported to said it was not us and any longer on the list. It turned out two girls were hiding, were caught and sent to die. Our guard was shocked and commented that she could not believe two poor Jew like us had managed to defy the selection. It's not much, too much anymore, so I will finish it. I realize that 
when my family was deported from the ghetto, we did arrive at Auschwitz, not Birkenau. As I said to you, I remember walking through the gates alone with my sister and the rest of the people not sent to the gas chamber and saw the sign above the gate that said, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free, and the orchestra of concentration of camp prisoners were playing the welcome song which sang, said, Auschwitz is a lovely place. However, walking through Auschwitz with you, I was aware that this was not Birkenau. After walking another five kilometers between Auschwitz and Birkenau, I realized that the train tracks to Birkenau were not yet completed. So what the Nazis did was take us through Auschwitz and walked us to Birkenau, seeing all this with you. So many years later, it took me a while to realize how early we were deported to Birkenau. It was also very frightening after all these years that my barrack, 27, was so close to the gas chamber. Thought I was aware of the order all, all the time, and we all knew Jews were being murdered. The crematoriums were hidden from us. Those going to, the, to their dead had to walk below the ground to enter the crematorium. Right next to the gas chamber was the barrack called Canada, where all prisoners were stripped of the precious items that they brought with them. I guess this is the end. I had now been in Birkina for almost two years. I lost all of my family, except my younger sister, and many of those who arrived with us in the deportation that August 1943. How I survived this living dead for all this time, I will never know. The march of the dead began January 15, 1945, when the Nazis pushed us out of Birkenau, and we all began what, what became known as the Dead March. We were walking for almost two weeks without food. The only thing that kept us alive was the snow on the ground. This march towards Germany was the most frightening experience based on our fragile conditions and the increasing brutality of the Nazis. The ability to stay alive seemed impossible. We were marching and on each side of us were SS men with machine guns and rifles. If someone had slowed down, they were shot. The kind of things I saw during this march is hard to describe. Bodies on the ground without arms or legs. We were terrified as we continued walking. Especially my sister who kept on giving up. I managed to persuade her that it was near the end of the war and she must continue in order to survive. By the end of January, we came to Ravensbrück, Germany. You heard about Ravensbrück. My feet had given up, and my left foot had very little circulation. By the time, by the time we arrived at Ravensbrück, pieces of flesh kept falling off my existing toes. The nurses were trying to push me into the infirmary, knowing full well, as I did, that I would never leave there. Ravensbrück was a camp where they did many experiments on people as skinny pigs. I already knew that, that and therefore refused to, refused to go. Fortunately, the SS couldn't, could only keep us there for a couple of days because they were told that the Russian forces were closing in, so we continued our march to Neustadt Leve. This was a small camp and there were there we were made to dig ditches to bury the people so there would be no signs of survivors. We worked there till May 2nd, 1945. The Nazis did not succeed in killing all of us and the few remaining were liberated. It is hard to know how few of us survived because they split us up to several camps 
after arriving in Germany. So in my mother's memory, the, prom I, the promise I made to her and the promise survivors made to one another, we would tell others what the Nazis and the Holocaust did to all of us and our families. This is already after, but this is the arrival after the, after the camps. After liberation, I wanted to go back, to get back to my hometown, Benjin, and see who had survived for my family. That was the only home I knew. My sister was very ill, but I was determined to find out our way home. Near the camp we were liberated from was another camp that held Polish soldiers. They opened our gate and I asked a soldier if he was going back to Poland and if he, if he could take us along with several other women. I remember seeing two horses near a farm with a German family. I told the soldiers, if I show him where the horses were, could they take them and take us home? They got the horses and the wagon and they took us back to Poland. They were kind and protected us from the chaos that was everywhere. As we approached the border to Poland, I saw a train grab my, sis grab my sister and my friends and we got on it. This train took me very close to my home. When I arrived, I saw a friend who told me he was staying with my brother. When I, that, that was, and that, this brother had survived by escaping during the dead march. So I boarded a trolley car, intent of finding my brother and looking everywhere. All of a sudden, by a miracle, through the window of the bus, I recognized the familiar face of my family and recognized my older brother. He jumped off his trolley into mine and we embraced each other. We began crying as we realized we were all that was left. It was a rare moment to see the reaction of the Poles in my community crying with us. The next day I left my sister resting and went to the local market to find some food. I saw our housekeeper who had lived with us for many, many years and helped raise my siblings. I ran over with excitement to her boat and felt as if I had found another family member. However, the welcome was not what I expected. She pointed her fingers at me and said, Esther, you are still alive. I knew then what I already understood only too well. Poland would never again be my home. I told my brother he could remain if he wanted to, but I was taking my sister and leaving. The three of us and my brother's fiancé who did survive, ended up in a displaced refugee camp in Austria. I want to add a note about how my brother reunited with his fiancée, who he was engaged to before the war. Her father had died in the early part of the war, and my brother knew where he was buried. So he went and left a note on the boots, boot market at the cemetery, knowing if, she, if his fiancée survived, she would visit her father's grave. Finding the note is how they reunited. Initially, we, were, we all wanted to go to Israel, but it was impossible, as the British, along with many other countries, were preventing Jews from emigrating there. That many of us, including myself, had relatives living there who had left Eastern Europe as Zionists, inspired by Herzl, in the 20th and 30th century. It was natural that we wanted to reunite with whatever family members we had. Instead, the British and allies pushed us into displaced refugee camps in part of Europe, and we ended up in Salzburg, Austria. So, the so we're going to take a break now. What? We're going to take a break. Okay, and, uh, but I guess, did I read it clear? Did that was you? so clear. Very clear. You know what, I couldn't, I couldn't say it by heart, you know, this is 70 years later. Okay. 
think that's very good because you